Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now this week, Lockheed Martin surprised the world by revealing their concept of a reusable lunar lander vehicle. This was surprising because, well, NASA hadn't asked for anything like this. The biggest they've asked for is a 500 kilogram lander concept. But this is a monster 60 ton vehicle when it is fully fueled up with hydrogen. It is designed to be reusable for several landings. Now, to get the performance it needs for a single stage landing and return to the original orbit, it needs to use the hydrogen and oxygen, and that means it has a really big tank. And because the tank is so big, the astronauts are going to be 14 meters off the ground. What this video doesn't show is the fact that they have an elevator on the exterior of the vehicle to get to and from the lunar surface. The design was originally presented at the International Astronomical Congress in Bremen, Germany. And, well, what I like to do when I see these grand ideas is re-implement them in Kerbal Space Program. And when I say Kerbal Space Program, I really mean realism overhaul, which has realistic engines. You can actually go in and we have real engines from real spacecraft. I mean, obviously, we've got common things like the, the F1 series, which was used in the Saturn V. In fact, I have several variants of the F1 because I've got several overlapping mods. We have the J2 series, and some of these have multiple variants. So these are the RL10 engines, and if I bring up the GUI here, it actually shows that we have many variants. Now, the design specifically said it was an RL10 C. The problem is that this only has 10 ignitions and it only has it has a minimum of 100% throttle. And when I tried landing with that, that's kind of hard because you can't throttle down the engine. So instead I went with the CC base, which was a version of the engine that was intended to be used in the Altair lunar lander, which was part of the Constellation program. It never really progressed beyond the uh, the drawing board, but the engine did actually get developed and tested. Now, this has lower thrust than the 10C, but it does throttle down to 7%. So here it is in orbit, operating from the Lunar Orbiting Platform Gateway, which is, well, okay, this is not a near rectilinear uh, halo orbit. This is a highly elliptical orbit with a peri -loon that's pretty close to the lunar surface. So, uh, this here is going to operate as a propellant depot. It's going to obviously be the place where this thing returns to after every landing. First thing to do is, at the appropriate time, we're going to undock. The appropriate time is when we get much closer to the surface. And despite this being realism overhaul, Undocking the spacecraft is still basically a right-click away. It's not like the real space station where you have, you know, a checklist as long as my arm to make sure you don't accidentally unlock, undock the Soyuz when there's nobody inside it and suddenly they're left with no way to get home. No, just right-click and then back away from the space station using the reaction control thrusters. Now, I didn't look at the paper in too much detail, but I didn't see any reference to hypergolics or reaction control thrusters. So I'm going to presume that the reaction control and maneuvering thrusters are still going to use, um, you know, hypergolics because those are the kind of things that could be turned on and off very quickly. I mean, obviously, it would be better if, they're, if they would go with hydrogen and oxygen because that is the lightest fuel, or sorry, it's the most efficient fuel. However, there are other concerns. When you're building a reaction control system, the thrusters need to be able to turn on and off very rapidly. And for that, you really need hypergolic thrusters. I do not believe there are any uh, hypergolic, so there are any uh, hydrogen oxygen thrusters that work for reaction control systems. Now, one of the big constraints of this is that it needs to be able to go to and from the lunar platform and gateway in one stage, right? There doesn't, there's got to be completely reusable. And I'm going to say that is a little disingenuous because it would actually make a lot of sense for it to have a staging tank that it leaves in low moon orbit lands and then on return to space it picks it up again. That would save a lot of mass and it would make it far more efficient. As it stands, it looks like they would have to transport something like 40 to 50 tons of fuel and other consumables to the lunar pl platform so that they could land this thing. And that's, that's a, like a whole SLS trip. 
However, you know, if you look at the Altair, which was the Constellation program's equivalent to this, it was a two-stage vehicle, which would have an ascent module and a landing module. It actually used five RL-10 engines, four on the landing stage and one on the ascent stage. It had a lot less consumables, but overall, I believe the vehicle massed 45 tons. So actually, this isn't so ridiculous. In fact, it seems to be slightly an improvement. On the other hand, because the Altair would have to be sent up for every single mission, it could land 15 tons, whereas this design is only designed to bring down one ton of hardware. Anyway, the mission profile would involve putting it into a low moon orbit, possibly with a deflection of the orbital plane, and then it, once it got to the correct orientation, it would begin a second burn to actually land it on the surface. Again, you can go back and watch my Tuesday night live stream where I performed this uh, with, with some success, actually. The, the one failure was when I had no throttling capability, and it was actually pretty amusing. I mean, I obviously threw it together quickly, trying to make it match roughly the mass, the performance capabilities, and the engines. But when they uh, presented their white paper, their concept was largely based on deriving as much as possible from Orion capsule hardware. They wanted to have something that would use similar tooling for the welding, uh, similar avionics and electronics. Of course, as SLS has shown, using exactly the same engines and boosters as the Space Shuttle hasn't really helped the SLS get off the ground any faster. Of course, I've often said that when the Constellation program was shut down and then restarted as SLS, what they really should have kept was the upper stage, the capsule, the lander, and let you know SpaceX and ULA work on the launch vehicles. But digressions aside, you know, hydrogen and oxygen do make sense for this for many reasons. It is being used in the various stages of SLS. And as you might know, it's very easy to produce hydrogen and oxygen if you can find water. So if there is some way to prospect and acquire and then process water on the moon, you will have a fuel source. Although I feel that I should point out that just taking water and then electrolytically, you know, cracking it into hydrogen and oxygen gives you a mass ratio of about 8 to 1, which no hydrogen oxygen engine runs at that ratio because you want more hydrogen to get the higher uh, specific impulse. You, by having unburned hydrogen, you get a much more efficient exhaust. So you would actually have excess oxygen that you'd have to find a use for. Obviously, astronauts could breathe it for a certain amount of time, and that would be great since they're talking about staying on the lunar surface with this for a couple of weeks. Uh, now, this design has a couple of solar panels to provide low-level power source. It's not enough to keep the crew alive, but it is enough to charge some basic batteries, keep um, you know electrical processes, keep communications running. But we do have fuel cells on this. Now, because the lander is so tall because of that large hydrogen tank, the Lockheed Martin design includes an elevator. However, Kerbal Space Program does let me build jet planes and helicopters and rockets, but, you know, elevators, those are kind of rare. So instead, yeah, we're going to use a ladder. And I'm pretty sure the specific impulse of a Kerbal lander matches that of the real thing, for those that wonder. Although the Lockheed paper doesn't actually give us any details on this. Now, what would it do on the surface? Well, obviously, you could plant flags, do uh, prospecting for water and other stuff. You know, this is supposed to be taking the first steps in a long-term program on the moon. They specifically talk about how the lunar orbiting gateway is designed to give easy access to the polar regions of the moon and those are the regions where we would expect to find water. Certainly it's not well set up for base building or anything like that because it only has a cargo capacity of about one ton. In this case I decided to secure the cargo at the base underneath in these uh using docking adapters. So each of these things is about 250 kilograms, I believe. I don't know, it's, it's roughly there. The idea is this is a place where you could store the material. It would be easy to ditch once you had landed on the surface and unpacked. 
Now, of course, by comparison, the Altair lander was much more capable because, of course, it was a two-stage design and the hardware would have been essentially replaced after every use, so it could be custom designed. It include, include, included airlocks and uh, other hardware that could be on the descent stage. But after a couple of weeks of living on the surface, their time would be up and they would attempt to return to the lunar uh, orbiting gateway. Because, of course, they would. the lunar gateway is supposed to be on roughly a two-week orbit. That's the idea. So they would go from here into a low lunar orbit and then they would boost and rendezvous with the lunar orbiting gateway. Obviously, that requires launching at exactly the right time so your orbit uh, just intersects the target vehicle at the correct time, but yeah, this uh, it has at this point it has much higher thrust to weight, so it's able to get into orbit more easily. This uh, the Delta V in this spacecraft does suffer a little because first of all, I was flying it manually, and so I probably wasted stuff. I didn't do a suicide burn, which I really should have, but uh, you know computers can handle that stuff. But at this point, this whole lander concept is really just a concept, and it's one that's almost perfectly designed to shoehorn into the Lunar Gateway and the SLS system. And depending how you look at it, you might even accuse it of deliberately designing itself to look more attractive to the SLS, because it solves some problems in ways that eliminate other possible launch vehicles. But look, I'm going to leave you with an entertaining moment from my live stream where I attempted to land one of these things without the ability to throttle the engine. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe, unlike me in this next clip. So now, now we're down to like 400 meters per second. So, uh, my altitude is 500 meters. I'm pretty sure I'm going to crash this thing. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, 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 R, RCS. So do I have a suicide, I do have a suicide burn distance qualified here. Okay. We just need to make sure. Oh, crap. What the heck? I am surprised that I am still not blown up yet. Oh there, thank you. I knew it had to happen at one point. Well that'll be one for the highlights. Honestly, I was surprised that I got as far as I did there.